verse 1 it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We already defined that grace and sin don't mix. He says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Does that make sense? We who are dead to sin live any longer therein. And so it means that you are either in sin or you are in grace. You are either in sin or you are in grace. If you are in grace, then you are not in sin. If you are in sin, you are not in grace. And then he began to say many things, which I, 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 don't, I really would not want to get into because it's going to draw us into many other things. So let me look for the right verse of scripture to continue the discussion. In verse 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man, the one that we used to be, the uncircumcised man, the man that was under the dominion of sin, is crucified with him that the body, the entire structure of sin might be what? Destroyed. That's what grace did for us. It destroyed the body of sin. That henceforth we should not do what? Serve sin. This is just to show us the direction of grace. How does it go? That henceforth we should no longer serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And grace has freed us from sin. Its nature, its power, and its consequences, its penalty. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death had no more dominion over him. When I read this I deduced something. Which I would like to just mention right now. It says knowing that Christ. See the example what Christ did. Christ being um, Raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death had no more dominion over him. And that's where we're going. It's our future. It says for in that he died, he died unto sin. How many times? Once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. In that he died, he died unto what? Sin. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And as long as you are living unto God, death hath no dominion over you. I don't know if you are catching this. As long as you are living unto God, death hath no dominion over you. Because the victory of grace is the dismantling of the structure of sin. And the wages of sin is death. So grace is reconstructing a structure of righteousness in us. Spirit, starting from our spirit into our souls and then into our bodies eventually. So the structure of righteousness is the construction work that grace is doing in us right now. And the way that is done is by us living unto God. You will see this very soon. There's something I actually want, want to get us to. It says likewise in the same manner as Jesus likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. 
You say, am I dead unto sin? The Bible says, reckon yourself indeed to be dead unto sin. But why do I still feel the motions of sin in my members? Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Because that is what grace has accomplished for you. The feelings and the motions of sin want to bring you to the place where you will deny faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith does not walk by feelings. But the feelings and the motions of sin in our minds, our thought life, in our bodies, tend to want to pull us away from grace, from the work of grace, to dislodge us from our liberty in Christ. You see, but I still think these thoughts. Yes. I still feel this way. Oh, yes. So if I still feel this way, and I still think these thoughts, then I have not really changed. The Bible says, no, son. You have changed. You are not your feelings. You're not your feelings. Your feelings are standing out. Crying out against the power of grace in you. What should you do? By faith. Reckon yourself dead. To those wrong thoughts. To those motions of sin in your members. So I can walk around. When the feelings are there. And the thoughts are there. And the motion to respond in anger and speak hateful words and say curses. And all those things are just walking within and mobilizing everything inside me to move in a certain direction. And I stop and I say, I stand in the grace of God. I reckon myself dead to all your suggestions. You have no hold over me anymore. The man you had the hold over was crucified with Christ. Many of us Christians don't know how to fight this battle anymore. And for that reason we can't reign. We feel. And we fall. Instead of feeling. I'm moving in the direction of faith. And take a stand. On that which has been provided you. And you say well but it's by grace. Yes it's by grace. Through faith. By grace, yes. But through faith. If faith is not mixed with grace, power is never released. So your faith must be mixed with it. How? Reckon yourself to be what grace says you are. And actually, the apostle Paul was breaking down, ruling by grace and righteousness. That's what, that's what he was really explaining here. How do you reign? What do you reign over? What to reign over are the motions of sin in your members. What to exercise dominion over are the motions of sin in your members. Your mind. Your feelings. Your intuitions. Your intellect, your desires, your perceptions, your emotions, and all the psychological influences that are built around you, and the desires of your body for food, for sleep, for sex, for many things. Rain. Conquer them. Exercise dominion. That's what grace came to empower us to accomplish. Are you sure? Let's 
quickly read through so that we can come to a conclusion. It says in verse 11, Likewise reckon yourselves, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not. What does it mean to let not? Put a stop to it. Why? Because you have authority. Now reign. Exercise dominion. Take charge. By grace. Through righteousness. Why by grace? Because grace has given me a nature, a new nature. So what is it telling me to do? Stay it up. Align with it. Move in the direction of the will of God. This is who you now are. Not what I used to be. In the past, when I felt this way, I did this. Yes. Now, when you feel that way, you do something else. Why is that so? Because when I was not under grace, I was a slave to sin. And as a slave, I was under the dominion of sin. But now that I'm under grace, I am a slave to righteousness. And if you do not recognize your slavery to righteousness, you will fall many times over. From slavery to slavery, yes, there is a slavery that leads to bondage. There is one that is of liberty. And when he calls this slavery, a slave doesn't have a choice, doesn't have an option. That's why he says a slave, a doulos. A slave is under mandate to walk in sin because he's not under grace. But the one who has been admitted into the grace of God is under mandate to respond in righteousness. I don't know if you're following this. On the mandate to respond in righteousness. And when you respond in righteousness because you are under grace, then you exercise dominion. Isn't that just the reason why many of us believers have very polluted personalities? Our personalities are not sanctified. We don't experience transformation because we don't exercise dominion. There is no purity of heart because there is no exercise of our authority in Christ. Because when we talk about authority in Christ, the first thing that comes to our mind is to chase the devil away somewhere or to, to deal with sickness in our bodies. That's the first thing. And as a matter of fact, the only thing, when we talk about our authority in Christ, that's what we talk about. But the beginning, the root of your authority is your authority or dominion over sin. That's the key. So your prayer life becomes more effective because I do not regard iniquity in my heart. So you can walk in the provisions of the covenant like Jesus said, go sin no more so that this doesn't come upon you. Let them lay hands on you. And if there is any sin, it shall be forgiven you. Sin has to be dealt with. Because it's the number one assignment of grace. Don't bask in the euphoria of what grace has accomplished. Then you look at them in the surface without understanding the depth. Why is the church so powerless? Because there's so much sin in the midst of the people of God. Why is there so much sin? Because we have allowed sin to conquer us. We have not understood the power of grace. The force of grace. The reason for it. The gains of it. We haven't understood it. 
one of the things grace provides for us is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We identify that now. It's one of the things that God's grace. Because you say, wherein we stand, I stand in grace. And in grace, I have the power of the, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, one of its major, as a matter of fact, its primary reason for being in you is to cause you to move in a certain direction. That's what scripture says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27, I think. It says, and I'll put my spirit within you to cause you to move in a certain direction. I checked the meaning of the word cause there. It means to, to make, to produce. And then one beautiful last definition. I loved it. To cause you to walk in my statute. Hey, it says to press and to squeeze. So the spirit of God on the inside of me is the assistance that grace has given to me. To live right and do his will. No wonder the Holy Spirit is referred to as a helper. He's our helper in grace. Oh, it's by grace. Yes, it's by grace. Because it is by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Only by grace can you accomplish it. Yes, it's only by grace that you can accomplish it. Because it's the Holy Spirit who steers you in that direction. And when you obey, he is the one who strengthens you. To fulfill or accomplish that goal. So Philippians 2 and verse 13 says, For God is at work. Hey, we can call it, but for the Holy Spirit is at work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So how does that go? It means that the presence of the Holy Spirit inside me, I could also translate that, that verse as, for it is grace that is at work in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So when the motions of sin begin to move in my body, in my members, and in my mind, and I'm thinking and imagining things that I shouldn't, I'm desiring things that I should not desire, the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, as sin is working, the Spirit is working within. What is he doing? He's pressing me and squeezing me to move in the right direction. So one mind said I should do this. The other mind said I should not. The more you cooperate with the spirit, the stronger you become in grace. The more you take the prompting of the Holy Spirit for granted, the weaker you become in grace. You are dying. Your strength lies in recognizing the voice of the spirit within you. And the voice of the spirit will always lead you to conform to the will of God. Does this work in marriage? Yes. Does it work in business? Yes. Does it work in ministry? Yes. Do you subject your desires? To the scrutiny of the word of God. Do you evaluate. Your passions. The suggestions that you have to move in a certain direction. Or to do certain things. With the mind of Christ. Say but there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Nothing. But is it what God wants you to do? Eh, not sure. Whatever is not of faith. is sin. And faith has its foundation. Not just in your confidence. But in the revealed truth. Of God's word. Are you seeing it? I am. Let's see how far we can go before I stop. 
What verse did I stop at? 12. I just said let us. Let not. Let not means that you have the power to stop. Let not means that you have the power to say no. Let not, not means that you have the power not to be influenced. Now, you shouldn't be beggarly about exercising dominion over sin. You shouldn't be beggarly. Or you say, I'm, I'm, this habit, I just can't break it. You shouldn't be beggarly about it. Take a stand, my friend. Say, but it's a bad habit. I don't know what to do. You know everything to do. Suppose there's a demon spirit that is hanging over me. One of the first things the Bible says in the book of Mark 16, it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall drive out devils. You can lay hands on yourself in your room or wherever you are and command that spirit to take his ugly hands off your mind and the habit will break. Because we have raised Christians who are so lily-livered and they cannot take charge of their lives. You're taught truth. You say, yes, I know, but pastor, pray for me. Does pastor have more access to the presence of God than you? He doesn't. He has just as much access as you have. The same admittance into grace is what everybody has. Same access. Or do you hear that there's a special grace that ministers enter into that others don't? The same grace. If it's working for him, he should work for me. If I've tried, I don't know what to do, then I should go to him and ask, how? Show me the way. How do you, how do you, how do you overcome this? I, I want to learn to overcome this. And most times when we pray, we don't pray. We, we, we pray beggarly prayers, if you know what I mean by that. Just go to God and cry like a baby when God wants you to stand as a man. He didn't say, come beg me to stop it. He said, let it not. There Moses was, the army of, 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 of Egypt behind him and the Red Sea before him. He didn't know what to do. But a provision had already been made for him. He didn't know. Run to God. God, please, what do I do under the circumstance? These people that, that you, you led me to bring out. What do I do? We're trapped. And the Lord said, Moses, yes, Lord, what do you have in your hand? A rod? Nah. It's not a rod. It's a staff. Of authority. Stretch it. And divide the sea. He didn't say stretch it and I will divide. Stretch it and divide the sea. Ah, ah Moses tried it. He walked. He, when the Israelites passed. He didn't wait to ask God again. He pointed it and closed it. Now he knew he had something. We just said. That the scepter of authority. That grace has is what? Righteousness. I have a bad habit. Stretch forth the staff of righteousness and break it. There is no devil hashed out of the pit of hell that has authority to reverse the work of grace. None. Only you can in your own life. The devil cannot stop it. He is not equipped to stop the work of grace. He can't. But you can in your own life and say, I don't want, or I can't, or I won't. Out of unbelief or ignorance. I hope you're following this. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in the loss thereof. So he's not saying that it will not suggest to you to not come to canvas for Support, it will not come to entice you. God didn't say that. You will be enticed. My son, if sin has enticed thee, consent thou not. Consenting is yours to give. The suggestions will come. That's what he's saying here. So say that you obeyed the laws thereof. No, you don't have to obey. He says, neither yield your members as instruments of what? 
on righteousness. Unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as what? Those that are alive from where? The dead. So understand the connection of everything together. Those that are alive from the dead. And your members as what? Instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14 says, For sin shall not do what? Have dominion over you. Why? He says, For ye are not where? Under the law, but under grace. I am under grace. I stand in grace. I have received an abundance of grace. I am empowered to rule, exercise dominion. Where does it begin from? Dealing with emotions of sins in my members. Renewing my mind. Circumcising my desires and my passions. Sanctifying my emotions. Changing my behaviors. There is no such thing that that's the way I am. If you want to say that is the way I am, then say what Paul said. I am what I am by the grace of God. So identify with the grace of God, not with your ancestral past. I am what I am by the grace of God. I am no longer what I was by my DNA. Are you following this? Identify with the grace of God. Verse 15. He says, what then? Shall, shall we sin because we are not under the law? But under grace? God forbid. For know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of what? Obedience. Unto what? Righteousness. Then he says in verse 17, but God be thanked that ye were Ye were, ye no longer are, that ye were servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of grace, which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. So it means that holiness is the evidence of the dominion of grace in your life. If holiness is not present, that is an evidence of the dominion of sin. Where grace rules or where you rule by grace. Holiness is the product. Where you submit to the motions of sin, death is the consequence. And that means that every born again child of God designed to reign is supposed to produce holiness. It's what the word teaches. I add nothing to it. Let me just read the next, uh, the, the, from 22 and 28. And we'll close. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end Everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need to keep these things in our minds, especially in the days that we are living in. 
as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, he that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself. I'm just lending my voice to echo the scriptures. Which is not my interpretation. This is what the Bible is saying. To echo the scriptures. To remind us. What is required of us as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now is the time to start taking charge. Now is the time to fill your vessel with, vessels with oil. Let's not be like the foolish virgins. Who waited until the very last minute. To make that change. And they went to the wise. And the wise virgin said to them. Go by. We can give you what we have. Why did he say go by? Because there's a price to pay. And you must learn to pay that price. And that price is to deny yourself the pleasure of sin. The prize is to present your body a living sacrifice, holy unto God and acceptable unto God. The prize is not to allow your mind to be squeezed into mold by the world, but rather that your mind be renewed so that you can prove that which is good, acceptable and perfect in the sight of God. The price to pay is that you do not esteem yourself more highly than you ought price to pay is to take a stand and minister as an oracle of God in your own little environment according to the grace that is given unto you. The price to pay is not to render evil for evil. The price to pay is to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, even if it's your enemy. The price to pay is to serve the Lord with all diligence, like the Bible says. Be not slothful in business. The price to pay is to be vigilant, to watch and pray. There is a price to pay. Study the scriptures. Take time. Learn the disciplines of godliness. And move in the direction of God's will. Walk in love as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things that grace wants to produce in every one of us. And when you say grace, I believe you understand what we're talking about now. God bless you. Stay in the grace. Amen. <laughs>